You are a Mongol commander in the steppe. In the distance, the opposing army is charging at you. You are evenly matched in skill, but you notice that the army is much larger than you expected, twice the size of yours. Your soldiers are eager to fight and die for you and their Khan, but you, being a seasoned steppe warrior, know that the battle is lost without having superior numbers or better firing power. With no place to run, you expect to take out at least half of their forces. You and your men charge into battle. It is hard fought. With horse and bow, you and your men fire as swiftly and as ferociously as you can. Finally, as you are down to your last man, you get a look at the remaining army's number and notice that you haven't taken out nearly as many as you'd hoped. Well, what happened? You're evenly matched rider to rider, so you'd expect that each of our soldiers would take out at least one of theirs. Well, there's more to the story than you might think. Battles like this can be modeled using a set of differential equations called the Lanchester Laws, and more specifically, the Lanchester Square Law. If you spectate a one-on-one -on -one battle, things happen the way you'd expect. If we go 2 on 2, 3 on 3, and eventually 10 versus 10, we consistently see the armies cancel each other out. What if we slowly increase the enemy's number? So instead of 10 versus 10, we do something like 10 versus 12, 10 versus 14, and finally 10 versus 20. We see the result play out that we lose the ability to take down more of their soldiers as the opposing army grows. So we can start modeling this with equations. We can expect the enemy's army to lose one soldier based on the firing power of our soldiers and the number of soldiers we have firing. You can expect our army to lose one soldier based on the enemy's firing power and multiply the number of soldiers that they have firing. Now keep in mind that the number of soldiers on both sides will change during the battle. And this explains what we see in our simulation. The larger army will deplete our army faster than we can deplete theirs. It will eventually get to the point that our army is so ineffective that we can't even take out a single one of theirs. The Lanchester Equations published in 1916 describe an army strength being proportional to the square of the number of soldiers. So if we turn back the hands of time and retreat instead of facing off against the larger army, we can try again. We will wait until the army splits up to raid different parts of our territory. The enemy splits their force into five parties and we can now face off against each of them. What we've seen here is known as concentration of force, used by many great generals like Napoleon himself. We went into each battle assuming that our enemy was our equal, but what if we had an advantage over them, like higher ground? Well. The Lanchester equations can describe that too. If our higher ground gave us 25% more damage, and our enemy firing uphill gave them 25% less firing power, we would have a key advantage. This time we see our enemy chasing after us, and we make it to higher ground. You'll see that we can take out a force much larger than ours. Now although the Lanchester Square Law applies to attrition style warfare, these equations or equations very similar to them pop up in other situations. In the same way that the inverse square law pops up in gravitation and other laws of nature. You graduated at the top of your class in university in a very competitive science program. You worked a part time job and were on the varsity wrestling team. Despite all your success thus far, you have what might end up being a fatal flaw. You are a woman. You decide to enter a PhD program in physics because, well, that's what you like and you'll be damned if anyone or anything keeps you away from it. It turns out that your class is 99% male. Assuming that your male classmates are sexist, you are hopelessly outnumbered. Not only are there far more men in your class, there are far too few women to receive these comments. So instead of sexism received being proportional to the number of mongoloids you encounter, it's actually the square of being outnumbered. This is a tall order for anyone. Using some code written by author David Chart, we can simulate this. Let's assume that men and women have a 50% chance of being sexist when given the opportunity. And we can say that we are dealing with a population of 50 people. 
20% of whom are female. Let's pretend that the individuals in our population group up randomly into conversations, and that a person only makes a sexist remark if they are not outnumbered by members of the opposite sex. If we were to simulate the results of a thousand conversations, it would look like this. 35% of men do not receive a single remark. A quarter receive one remark. The rest receive at least more than two, with the most unlucky man receiving eight comments. The women who encountered the least amount of sexism received 55 remarks, and the most unlucky woman received 93. This is known as the Petri multiplier, invented by British computer scientist Karen Petri. The assumption that 50% of people being sexist might sound absurd, so we can simulate this again with the probability of a person being sexist being 10%. The results of a thousand conversations looks like this. 75% of men do not receive a single remark, while 20% receive one remark, and the two most unlucky men receive two remarks. Meanwhile, three women receive less than 10 remarks, and the most unlucky woman receives 21 remarks. We see instances of representation being an issue throughout many industries, and even in hobbies. We then act surprised that inclusive environments foster more and more of that once excluded minority. Things like support groups and allies might seem pointless and unfair to some, but it could make a world of a difference for a lot of people. That's it from me. Till next time.